So today I'm here to speak about the art in the book, and I, I am very grateful for the opportunity to do that. I thought I would start um, by reading a little bit of text, and then I'm going to move um, to Citizen, and I will read the piece that precedes the image, and then I will speak about the image. In case you're wondering, what's she doing? I don't understand why she's doing it that way. That's why. Okay, so this, this will take a second. I just want you to know sort of what I was thinking about and how I like to theorize what I'm doing. Roland Barthes, in Theory of the Text, makes the claim that the classical sign is a sealed unit whose closure arrests meaning, prevents it from trembling or becoming double or wandering. The same goes for the classical text. It closes the work, chains it to its letter, rivets it to its signified. The use of images in Citizen is meant in part to destabilize the text so both image and text would always have possibilities, both realized and unimagined by me. Beyond my curating powers, consequently I wanted to create an aesthetic form for myself where the text was trembling. I was interested in how the dynamic of intertextuality differently energizes a text. This resonates partly because I feel that the entrance of the black body works like that in the American landscape. You can have a seemingly predictable conversation on the phone, and then you enter the room, and your image derails expectations for public decorum and decency. So that dynamic of having a skin color that apparently throws things off from um, the perceived normal progression. I mean, I, I could say a lot about normal as, and what that means as well, but um, I wanted to create a book that was constantly shifting structurally and also internally for the speaker and for the reader. And one of the ways of doing that besides shifting forms was also to shift um, genres and to curate the images inside the text, which then turned the text themselves, the, 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 um, the poems into a kind of portraiture so that the whole journey through the book becomes as if one is walking through a gallery. Um, so the first piece I'm going to read is the opening piece in the book, and then we'll look at the image that follows. I never read this piece, so it's kind of exciting. When you're alone, and too tired even to turn on any of your devices. You let yourself linger in a pass stacked among your pillows. Usually you are nestled under blankets and the house is empty. Sometimes the moon is missing and beyond the windows the low gray ceiling seems approachable. It's dark light dims in degrees depending on the density of clouds, and you fall back into that which gets reconstructed as metaphor. The root is often associative. You smell good. You're 12, attending St. Philip and James School on White Plains Road, and the girl sitting in the seat behind asks you to lean to the right during exams so she can copy what you have written. Sister Evelyn is in the habit of taping the hundreds and the failing grades 
to the coat closet doors. The girl is Catholic, with waist-lent brown hair. You don't remember her name. Mary? Catherine? You never really speak except for the time she makes her request. And later, when she tells you, you smell good and have features more like a white person. You assume she thinks she is thanking you for letting her cheat and feels better cheating from an almost white person. Sister Evelyn never figures out your arrangement, perhaps because you never turn around to copy Mary Catherine's answers. Sister Evelyn must think these two girls think a lot alike or she cares less about cheating and more about humiliation, or she never actually saw you sitting there. So um, the image that follows that text is this. Um, that street, if you want to buy a house on it, <laughs> want to forego the Confederate flag and go instead to Flowery Branch, Georgia, um, you, can, you can get a house there. I saw this image um, in the work of a photographer, and I was interested in it. Um, his name is Michael David Murphy. And I was interested in it for a number of reasons. Um, the school in that piece I just read was on White Plains Road. And so then I began to think, well, here's one road, and here's another road. And if we put all these roads together, we have the whole country. And um, so that sort of, in a very kind of simplistic way, was what made me put the piece where I put it. Obviously, what made me want to use the photograph um, was the street name, Jim Crow, James Crow, Jim Crow Road. It's supposedly named after James Crow. Um, and then I asked, why didn't they just name it James Crow if it's named after James Crow? <laughs> no answer forthcoming there. Um, but what you might find interesting about the photographer, uh, Michael David Murphy, he has a series entitled Unphotographables, in which he writes about photos that, unlike Jim Crow Road, he couldn't take for one reason or another. Text stands in the place of the image. So in his work, when he sees um, an image, and he cannot get the camera out or doesn't have the camera. He then writes the text of the image and um, frames that on the wall as a text. So it was, in a sense, the inverse. And so his process I found very generative. And it also reminded me, I don't know if you know the photographer Jeff Wall. He. Um, he does, it's, you know, there are many pathways to the same moment. So when he sees an image and um, it exhibits something that he wish he could hold forever in his camera, he then goes back, hires actors, and reenacts it. Um, and uh, Jeff Wall talks about um, unfreedoms. So he's, he's interested in moments when um, sort of they're very similar to microaggressions. When you see a moment and you understand that moment is limiting the freedom of the person through an interaction, and it happens in the split second and often too fast for the camera to get at it. And so then he hires the actors. The fame, one of his famous ones is um, there's a white couple walking down the street. And 
the white man passes an Asian man and he takes his hand and he puts it up against his eye like that. And that's it. That's the moment he saw. So that's the moment he enacted. Okay, so that's, we'll stay on Jim Crow Road for a minute there. The next piece, um, when I was putting together Citizen, I, it was basically a community project. So in, in the same way that the images are curated through the work of, of artists that I admire. This, many of the stories in the, in the book were given to me through friends because I asked them questions, they answered the questions I wrote down um, later usually, um, what I heard. And um, so one of the questions I asked my friends was tell me a story of a moment when you were about to have an interaction with someone and suddenly race came in and really threw the moment out. I mean, we, we are in the week of Charleston right now. We understand that you're sitting in your prayer group. You think you're just doing what you do on Wednesday evening and then you're dead, right? So what is a moment where you are in the course of your day doing something ordinary and suddenly race steps up. So this was, um, of all the stories that were just told to me, this was the only one that surprised me. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment? She spits back, then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh yes, that's right, I'm sorry, I am so, so sorry. Um, so that happened with the th trauma th therapist. You know, it's just like one of those moments where you're like, no way. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Way, 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 way. So I said to my friend, then what happened? And she said, I went to the appointment. Because she had gone all that way. And, and we are so in the habit of doing the next thing, right? So she went to the appointment. And, um, and then I said, and then what happened? And then she said, um, I went home and I wept. And then she said to me, and this surprised me, I have to say, she said, and, oh, I guess I say it surprises me, but it, it wouldn't surprise me because it's kind of, I think I might do the same thing. But then she said, I then wrote her a letter canceling the next appointment, and which I said, you know, you made another appointment. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, I mean, you know, I was in there. She said, do you want another appointment? I said, yes. So, but in the text, it's followed by this. And the story, the reason why there are two um, of these images up there is that um, I 
saw that image, the, the one on the far right, by Kate Clark. And she's a, she's, she's a visual artist, but she uses taxidermy. And um, I, I was sort of interested in the idea that, you know, black people are often described as animals, savages, animals, gorillas, you know, you can fill it in. And I thought, well, there's this, um, Jose Munoz has this um, term called disidentification, in which you identify by overturning the 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 space of identity that's been created for you. So I thought, why not why not disidentify and find my own animal to be? And so the idea that blacks are in fact maintain their animal status, but instead become the animal that is hunted. Um, was interesting to me, and when I saw the Clay Clark um, image, and it's called Little Girl, I um, I wrote to her and I said, "Can I have the rights for this for the book?" And she said, "Well, um, can I read the book?" And I said, "Sure." So I sent her the manuscript, and she said, "Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we make an image?" for the book specifically. And so I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Why not? Why not, right? So so basically, I commissioned her to do a piece. What she ended up doing was this piece. And so she um, you know, worked very hard on it. And then she sent it to me. And I said, I don't want that piece. <laughs> because what it missed for me was the affect of the original piece, um, in terms of the look on the face. This one, um, you know, was a beautiful child, but it, it was not exactly, it didn't contain for me the questioning of the original. So we went back in the text for the other, to the other piece, the original piece. I felt bad, but you know, after all her hard work. But the next image in the book, um, if we're, you can't be online in this in this space, but it's actually a screen grab from a video by Jason Masusun. He um, his online persona is Hennessy Youngman. Has anyone seen any of his videos? Okay, so I it's it. I use him to begin the essay on Serena Williams, and so I'll just read a little so you have a sense of what he does. Hennessy Youngman, AKA Jason Massoon, whose art thoughts take the form of tutorials on YouTube, educate viewers on contemporary art issues. In one of his many videos, he addresses how to become a successful black artist, wryly suggesting black people's anger is marketable. He advises black artists to cultivate an angry nigger exterior by watching, among other things, the Rodney King video while working. Youngman's suggestions are meant to expose expectations for blackness, as well as to underscore the difficulty inherent in any attempt by black artists to metabolize real rage. The commodified anger his video advocates rests likely on the surface for spectacle's sake. It can be engaged or played like the race card and is tied slowly to the performance of blackness and not to the emotional state of particular individuals in particular situations. On the bridge between this sellable anger and the artist resides at times an actual anger. Youngman in his video doesn't address this type of anger. 
the anger built up through experience of the quotidian struggles against dehumanization every brown or black person lives simply because of skin color. This other kind of anger in time can prevent rather than sponsor the production of anything except loneliness. So he has, he, uh, um, if you go online under Art Tharts, you'll find them and they, you know, they're entitled things like how to be a successful artist. And then they'll say like first would be be white, would be his first. <laughs> Um, and then you know, and then he and then he has a uh, he did another one called "How to Be a Successful Black Artist," and that's where this comes from. Be angry. Inside the same essay is this image, um, and this is by the the uh, visual artist Nick Cave. Not the musician, but the the artist, and um, he does what is called sound suits. And it, there was—I don't know if you can still do this—but there was a time when, if you went to one of his shows, you could put on these sound suits. And I was very interested because you know he's this black guy. And he was making these incredibly beautiful garments that covered you from head to toe. And I was intrigued as to why he was making them. And I, everywhere I looked, I couldn't find anything. And you know, one of those, I don't know if you do this kind of thing, but I was, um, you know, I got books on Nick Cave, I got articles, and then I couldn't find anything because I was looking for something. You know how that happens. You're looking, you're reading a lot of stuff, but you know you're looking for something. And so I, I, I kept thinking, why is he making these? And so one day I just did that thing on, on the computer where you get like one to 10, and then you look at all those 10 articles, and then you get 11 to 20, and you look at all of those, <laughs> and then you get 21 to, and I just kept going back and back and back. And finally, there was an interview when he first started making them. And apparently, he started because of the beating of Rodney King. And he, in this interview, he said, well, if the problem is only skin color, why don't we just cover the whole thing up? And so, I just found it, um, besides the fact that they're incredibly beautiful, I, um, I knew that somewhere behind there, I would find that explanation, and it was there. So this is Nick Cave. There, um, there are many of them. He did a piece um, where people wore these suits in Grand Central Station, actually. The final... Um, image in the Serena Williams essay. I will read you... Now that there is no calling out of injustice, oh, I'll start here actually. Watching the newly contained Serena Williams, you begin to wonder if she's finally given up on wanting better from her peers, or if she too has come across Hennessy's art thoughts and is channeling his assertion that the less that is communicated, the better. Be ambiguous. This time, type of ambiguity could also be diagnosed as disassociation and would support Serena's claim that she has had to split herself off from herself and create different personae. Now that there is no calling out of injustice, no yelling, no cursing, no finger wagging or head shaking, the media decides to take up the mantle when on December 12, 2012, two weeks after Serena is named WTA Player of the Year, the Dane, Caroline Wozniacki, a former number one player, 
imitate Serena by stuffing towels in her top and shorts, all in good fun, at an exhibition match. Racist? CNN wants to know if outrage is the proper response. It's then that NSC's suggestion about how to be a successful artist returns to you. Be ambiguous. Be white. Wozniacki, it becomes clear, has finally enacted what was desired by many of Serena's detractors, consciously or unconsciously, the moment the Compton girl first stepped on court. Wozniacki, though there are a number of ways to interpret her actions, playfing, playful mocking of a pair, imitation of the mimicking antics of the tennis player known as the Joker, Novik Djokovic, finally gives the people what they have wanted all along by embodying Serena's attributes while leaving Serena's angry nigger hysteria behind. At last, in the real and unreal moment, we have Wozniacki's image of smiling blonde goodness posing as the best female tennis player of all time. So what's really interesting to me about Wozniacki's um, posing here is the way in which she has her hand placed at her buttocks. And I don't know, I mean, I don't want to, um, um, how can I say this nicely? I don't, <laughs> I don't want to underestimate what, what Wozniacki knows or does not know, but it seems as if she is underlying um, the Venus Hottentot figure um, by doing that. As if her audience might miss an intention that outruns the mimicking of Serena's Williams' body. So I think um, in looking at various images to use in the book, there were many images from this moment because she basically was prancing back and forth. Um, but this one um, was the one that I bought um, because, because of the gesture of the, 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 the hand. Whoops. The next image, and I'll read the piece that will keep us in the sports world. You were rushing to meet a friend in a distant neighborhood of Santa Monica. This friend says, as you walk towards her, you're late, you nappy-headed hoe. What did you say? You ask, though you have heard every word. This person has never before referred to you like this in your presence. Never before code switched in this manner. What did you say? She doesn't, perhaps physically cannot repeat what she has just said. Maybe the content of her statement is irrelevant and she only means to signal the stereotype of black people time by employing what she perceives to be black people language. Maybe she is jealous of whoever kept you and wants to suggest you are nothing or everything to her. Maybe she wants to have a belated conversation about Don Imus and the women's basketball team he insulted with this language. You don't know. You don't know what she means. You don't know what response she wants from you, nor do you care. For all your previous understanding, suddenly incoherence feels violent. You both experience this cut, which she keeps insisting is a joke, a joke stuck in her throat. And like any other injury, you watch it rupture along its suddenly exposed suture. So this image is, uh, um, do you all remember Don Imus and the comment? 
well, these were the women it, it was directed at. And um, initially, before the book was done, and I was going to use this image. This is John Newsom, and he conducts these orchestras of black women throwing shade. So if you go to a performance of his, what you get are women on stage, and the women are reacting in the moment after the event, after um, the microaggression has happened, after the thing has been said. And though their bodies hold silence, how they stand, how they move their head, what their eyes are doing, react. And so I was, I was interested in, in his work for the Serena Williams piece. And then, um, and then I had the real thing in this. And what's interesting, when I went to buy this photograph, I, I thought, why did they put that big R there? Does anybody know? Yeah, no, 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 I know that. <laughs> but why is it there? They're covering up what? What? What is being covered up? The white girl. <laughs> so they're cutting, they're covering. So I, I took me a long time to track down the original image, and and under that R is the white girl. And so, because this was the image that was used in the press. So the red curse was only put there to get her out, because it was not about her, apparently. Apparently she's not a Napa-headed hole. <laughs> and so, um, in a sense, I should have used the other image, but, um, but I was, it took, I, I just thought, why would they cut off one of the women? It might have been interesting if she had been kept in, in a certain way, in terms of, if you think about alliance, in terms of community, right? So I'm, um, in the service of time, I might not do every single one of these. But the next, um, the next image, I won't read the text. Um, oh, well, well, actually I will, because it's not very long. Um, this is Glenn Ligon, the visual artist. And the text that happens right before this image is, um, the real estate woman who didn't fathom she could have made an appointment to show her house to you spent much of the walkthrough telling your friend repeatedly how comfortable she feels around her. Neither you nor your friend bothers to ask who is making her feel uncomfortable. The funny story about this is this, you know, it happened, I, I'm, I'm there, and the woman just you know, kept talking to my friend. And then at a certain point I had to go do something. And then she said to my friend, which is not in the piece, but she said to my friend, I hope she doesn't think I'm racist. <laughs> and and, um, and my, my friend said to her, um, well, I'll, I'll tell her that you're worried. <laughs> I'll let her know. <laughs> So because of that, I, I thought it was, you know, this is how I have fun, I don't know. Um, I thought it was funny to follow that piece up with the Glenn Lycon, I do not always feel colored. I feel most colored when thrown against a sharp white background. So similar to Murphy's piece, um, 
I was really interested in the way that Ligon uses text as visual. And, and in the sense of the language fading out, um, by the time you get to the bottom of the page, that the information is no longer necessary because it becomes stitched in to, to our DNA. You know, so when people talk about where did Roof come from, um, Dylan Storm Roof, he came from America. You know, nothing that came out of his mouth did he not hear somewhere else. He didn't just rise up. He wasn't a meteor <laughs> thrown in. So, um, there's another image of Ligon that's in the, I'm just gonna show it now. This was taken at the Million Men March. And he, again, um, the image was then covered over and stripped back. So modes of erasure and, and what comes through being enacted. This next piece I'm gonna read and then I'll show the image. Um, I'm gonna have to become selective because we're running out of time. Um, so the conversation in this book in part had to do with what does it mean to hold the position of white privilege. And um, a shorthand way of talking about that is to talk about the use of the first person and, um, and who gets to, to really hold the position of the first person as opposed to the second person, which Master of the Book is in, in terms of the use of the you. And in thinking about that, it, I, the, the person most naturally one goes back to is Robert Lowell. Um, because for Lowell, taking on the first person was a big deal, actually. To move from modernism, where you speak for everybody, and then to move into um, the, the movement that, that he began called confessionalism, where he actually had a very unstable eye. I mean, the man was in in an insane asylum for a while. So, so I loved... Lowell as this kind of white petition person, having a, a f um, beginning the tradition of using the eye that does not include everyone, using an eye that is confessional, that is tied to a single body, and yet still holds the center. So this piece was conceived as a conversation with Robert Lowell. Sometimes I is supposed to hold what is not there until it is. Then what is comes apart the closer you are to it. This makes the first person a symbol for something, the pronoun barely holding the person together. Someone claimed we should use our skin as wallpaper knowing we couldn't win. That was Berriman. You said I has so much power, it's insane. And you would look past me, all gloved up in a big coat with fancy fur around the collar, and record a self saying, you should be scared, the first person can't pull you together. Shit, you're reading mine. But did you try? Tried rhyme, tried truth, tried epistolary untruth, tried and tried. You really did. Everyone understood you to be suffering and still everyone thought you thought you were the sun. Never mind our unlikeness. You too have heard the noise in your voice. Anyway, sit down. Sit here alongside. Exactly why we survive and can look back with furrowed brow is beyond me. It is not something to know. 
your ill-spirited, cooked, hell on Main Street, nobody's here, broken down first person, could be one of the many definitions of being to pass on. The pass is a life sentence, a blunt instrument aimed at tomorrow. Drag that first person out of the social debt of history, then we're kin. Kin, calling out the past like a foreigner with a newly minted fuck you. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you don't think so. Maybe you're right. You don't really have anything to confess. Why are you standing? Listen to you. I was creating a life study of a monumental first person, a Brahmin first person. If you need to feel that way, still, you are in here, and here is nowhere. Join me down here in nowhere. Don't lean against the wallpaper. Sit down and pull together. Yours is a strange dream, a strange reverie. No, it's a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. So many of those lines actually are from um, lines from Lowell's actual poems if you wanted to play a game, track them down, I don't know. Um, so that piece is followed by this piece by Mel Chin. I don't know if you can see it, um, but it's um, a black angel in touch with the gargoyles. Um, and what I loved about Pairing this with the Lowell conversation was that Mel Chin took the Spank and Wag encyclopedia, you know, before the internet, where you would go for the information <laughs> all the way back then. Um, and he took all the images out of the encyclopedia and then created these um, collages that became their own story and repositioned um, information up against each, each other in, in, in a form of intertextuality that I thought was very dynamic and interesting. Okay, I think we have time for two more. So this piece um, is the canonical linking, lynching piece from Indiana. Um, I'm trying to decide, do I read the text that precedes it, or do I not? OK, I will. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued. Then there are these days each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through, these brothers, each brother. My brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do understand. I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother. I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, 
another dawn where the pink sky is the bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless. Shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling, of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony. Accumulate into the hours inside our lives where they're all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots are limbs, a throat sliced through, and when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is the silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up, don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking, the talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot, is it cold, are you cold? It does get cool, is it cool, are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining, it is raining down. It was raining, it stopped raining, it is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there, he's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. So this um, was Marion, Indiana, August 7th, 1930. Tom Ship and Abe Smith um, are the gentlemen who were hanged. Um, so when I went to uh, get this image, the Holton Archive said no. They said I can't have it. And I guess I'm not used to. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, they said no, and I was like, oh, God. Um, so, but I'm also, you know, I like no meaning no, so I was like, okay. Um, but then my husband came home and he said, what happened? I said, they said no. And he said, well, call them back tomorrow. And he does documentary filmmaking, so he's all about getting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day I called back and sure enough somebody else answered the phone or the same person answered the phone in a different mood and um, so she said well actually no because we're afraid she didn't use the word white supremacist but she said we're afraid that the image will be taken and used in ways that are not compatible with our use of the image, or our understanding of the image. And I said, well, I would never use the image like that. And she said, well, how do I know that? And I said, well, I could send you my book. And so I did, I sent her the text. And then she said, sure, you can have it. But after going through all of that, I was very um, nervous about saying to her, well, actually, what I really want is that. So can I take the images of the hanging men out? The lynched men, I should say. And she was like, sure. Because for her, that's the point of anxiety. That's the thing that she thought, you know, some white supremacists would use as pornography, basically. And so she was fine with me um, photoshopping out the, the images and putting the emphasis where I think the emphasis actually belongs. Not on the spectacle, but on the white alliance with white supremacy. And the sense that none of this would be going on if all of you in this room didn't let it go on. Um, through silence. Um, Lorraine Hansberry said something. She said, um, it's time for white people to stop being liberal and start being revolutionaries. And 
I think we are at that moment. But every day is that moment, right? Every day is that moment. So, um, let's see what, how we're doing. I feel like I'm running a race. Okay, I have time for one more of these images, so I have to just pick which image I will use. So this image, um, this will end on this. I won't read what precedes it, but it's the, if I were to read it, it would be the um, transcript of Zaran after the World Cup up against passages um, from black male writers and, um, and Shakespeare and a few others. And also the text of the lip readers on the Italian player. So not what he actually said, but what the lip readers said he said in the interaction. What we did was we took the film frame by frame, the Zidane um, World Cup, and then we took out all of the players that were on Zidane's team so, the, so that the eye could track Zidane's body easily. So he's in the white uniform, obviously. So all of the other players who had on white uniforms we took out. And, um, and the idea was to arrive at the moment of impact and then consideration. So that is how that one was done. We end, um, the penultimate image in the book is Wangeti Mutu's image um, in which she uses collage. For me, images are meant in the words of Lauren Vallant, to create a multiplication of knowledges that have an awkward relation to each other, crowd each other out, create intensities that require management. And for me, that's what happens when Wangetimuti puts together these body parts inside of these collages. And it seemed to me that the negotiation of intimacy, which for me is really what Citizen is about, you know, what happens when people get in the same space and are forced to negotiate. And, um, and then their whole historical and personal self come into the room. The final image in the book is um, Turner's slave ship. Um, and the detail, obviously, the story of that is um, the ship captain threw the black slaves overboard to lighten the ship. And then when he got back to London, there was a trial because he had thrown away somebody's property. Um, and Turner was disturbed by this and so painted this and wrote actually a poem called The Felicities of Hope which when he showed the film, the, the, um, the painting the first time, it was accompanied with this poem. Um, the painting was then bought by Ruskin. Um, he was the first owner of the painting. That's all I have time for. But thank you very much for your... Uh, you know, I didn't say this, but this image is David Hammonds, a conceptual artist, um, who I who made this a few years after, the, in '93, after the beating of Rodney King. It's a piece of sculpture because often people think it was done in response to Trayvon Martin, but it didn't start with Trayvon Martin.